Contra will. Contra will have those four console stations, uh, Xboxes, PS2s, um, probably the new dinner ones, um, uh, and hopefully whenever Xbox 3, Xbox 360 comes out, whatever it is, PS3 comes out, we'll certainly have the, the latest and greatest in there. The basic idea will be that each station will have above it uh, a DLP uh, front projection unit. So the actual projection size on the screen across, um, across the, uh, the room will be on the order of seven, eight feet. So each one will have a separate screen ahead of it, fairly close. So it'll be a fairly strong experience, and each one will have a sound system associated with it. Um, that should be a wild room. <laughs> the laboratory facilities in general will have, we want to be able to explore games on, on portable devices. So um, uh, IPAC, uh, um, certainly uh, Nintendo DS, and when we get our hands on uh, PSP, uh, we'll certainly have probably about two of each you know, for students to take and, and, to, and to use. The virtual reality room will have a number of components in there, a lot, a lot of fun things. Um, and we'll have a couple of uh, uh, head-mounted displays. Um, 800, true 800 by 600 resolution um, and stereoscopic uh, capability. So 800 by 600 in each RGB uh, channel. So uh, pretty good on the display. Um, we'll have three haptic interfaces, um, two objects which are, they're about a grand a piece and they're, I wouldn't call them game quality. They're a little bit better than game quality, but they, they're not for sophisticated use for somebody who is simulating a surgical situation. Uh, this is a little bit more a fancy one. And, and it, all of the, the Omni ones and the desktop unit, um, this runs probably about um, almost 10 times uh, the cost of, of these. So it's more sophisticated. The main thing is the res higher resolution and also the, the amount of force that, that can be delivered back to somebody using it. So we're gonna have two uh, low-cost gaming one, so somebody can have a left and a right hand one, and move it all around, and it's and both of them are six degree of freedom, so you can move it all around here and, and rotate in terms of the angles uh, as well. So we'll have three haptic interfaces. We'll have uh, three tracking devices, one magnetic tracker, which it's actually the Polymus uh, Liberty, but not with the, the long range thing. It's, it's for this room, so we don't need a major thing at, at, at 20, 30 feet, whatever it is. Um, so we'll have one magnetic tracker, um, which will have six degree of freedom. Uh, so you can put it on a wrist and see where that wrist is going and how that wrist is rotating. We'll have two inertial trackers you can put on a head, uh, and that's three degree of freedom and, and move around. This thing is, is much more expensive than this. Um, but we, we then have the capability of someone moving around a room um, and rotating things uh, in hands and so on. And it, these both require uh, a tether, that's correct, yeah. Um, we'll have three data gloves, two um, less expensive data gloves that have five joints, uh, basically uh, these joints, um, and a left and right, and they both look the same, and one right-handed one, even though I'm left-handed, I, I went along and uh, went in with this, uh, one 14 uh, joint glove as well. And again, there's considerable difference in price. These we're looking at more in the gaming sense. This we're looking more in the more high fidelity simulation sense. So we'll have uh, these as well, basically to play with and, and to develop projects with and so on. And I, this is the best slide that I could find, picture that I could find. It kind of brings all these things together in terms of the virtual reality room. Uh, head mounted display, a couple of data gloves, I think. <laughs> Um, trackers, basically you can do these things as haptic interfaces. Uh, uh, although ours will be much much smaller and, uh, than this. In addition, in the virtual reality room, I have a couple of graduate students right now that are making another input device that allows you, again, all these things basically allow you to, to create input that, uh, that, that, that allow you to deal with a virtual world that you're seeing and, and or hearing. Uh, we also have, I have two graduate students that are working on a three-dimensional treadmill that will allow someone to walk around in, in, in the world that they create. And it's, it's a cool device. We've seen some other ones before that are bizarre. 
uh, that essentially have a treadmill and another independent treadmill and another independent treadmill that go around in like a Taurus configuration. And you walk in this way in one way, and then you walk in this one, and, you, and these things rotate in. Ours is going to be considerably simpler. That was the Army. <laughs> the Army built that one. Uh, and it probably weighs a couple of tons. But we're, we're building another one that allows someone to walk off, you know, left and right and walk around in a virtual world and, um, and also have it being raised. So if someone wanted to walk around San Francisco, um, they can just walk around and just see what's going on and feel that, that elevation change. So that's our VR room. Our immersion room, um, this is the best I can find. It's a single station, uh, probably pretty comfortable chair. Uh, we'll have uh, one. Uh, projection, front projection device, and that will uh, likely be a Barco. It's a 3D uh, projector. So uh, the students will be able to, to do 2D, they'll be able to do 3D, um, and, and be in this kind of office-sized room, totally black, uh, good sound system, and, and have a good sense of immersion. We'll have the consoles in here, as well as a high-end uh, PC, so they can use it really for, for both. That room I expect to be used quite a bit <laughs> as well. Um, and the audio room um, will have hardware and software associated with it. The, the hard, this is not actually that far from what it will probably look like. We'll have two uh, PCs in there, and, and we've chosen PCs over Macs. Uh, we originally had one PC, one Mac. All the other uh, computers are going to be PCs, um, just for a facility point of view, we're choosing two of them. Uh, one really for real-time work, one for uh, production work. Um, we're going to have monitors, uh, essentially surround sound, uh, self-powered surround sound uh, speakers, um, and we'll have three MIDI instruments, so sort of a MIDI band uh, will be in there. We'll have one 88 key uh, um, uh, MIDI keyboard, we'll have one um, uh, MIDI guitar, uh, essentially a Fender uh, Roland Ready uh, Strat, and uh, also a ha Roland Hansonic drum, which is um, essentially just a, ha a hand drum. So that people of, who are either musically trained and know how to deal with a piano or guitar can do it, or someone who's not musically trained and just wants to hit around, but has some sense of rhythm, hopefully, will be able to interact and create music. And of course, we're, the software will probably have, we're looking at uh, Reason 3 and Sonar 4. Um, uh, right now. Um, and that's our audio room. And that's just an example. Well, let me, I think, turn the, uh, literally turn the mic over <laughs> to Christian. Hello, everybody. I'm going to uh, deviate a little bit from Professor Buckner's deadpan delivery here. Deadpan delivery. Deadpan delivery. Oh, <laughs> uh, we've got this fantastic facility that's going to be opening up next fall. And we're trying to figure out, well, okay, Great hardware is great, but unless you do something interesting with it, like some of the projects that Professor Buckner was talking about, nothing will come of it. So we're going to be opening up the lab to people's projects. We're going to be opening up the lab to graduate student research, as he suggested before, with that 3D treadmill and hopefully other stuff in the future. But some of the more interesting stuff that we're going to be doing is classes. We're going to be teaching a series of three new classes, delving into video games and how to make them, how to produce them. Uh, and all other things with them as well. Now, in order to figure out what we're going to be teaching, it's better to just take a look at some games. So I've got a couple of videos here, and try, try to break it down into elements. Look at these videos, see all the things that are going on. We've got one example.
All right, that game came out a little while ago, but you still see a lot of graphics, some incredible sound design in there, some interesting background music, some inter a lot of ambient sounds going on in the background, you know, the ship rumbling in the background. You saw a lot of AI with the enemies taking cover behind crates and, you know, firing back and picking where they were throwing gr their grenades, all that sort of stuff. Now, just a tentative example of some of the things that can go into video games. There's even a lot more than this. But just take a look at that list. It's pretty long. And it also happens to map almost to one with what we teach in our courses at Case. So we figured, as Professor Buckner described earlier, some of these classes are not the most interesting classes around. So it might be beneficial if we took some of the projects in these courses and mapped them onto the corresponding parts of video games. In other words, we integrate interactive simulation in video games into the projects in some of our courses to help spice it up a little bit more. Hopefully students will be more receptive to something like that. Uh, and also, you know, if you're designing a network library for use in games, you've got some very interesting additional considerations uh, to, uh, to look at. If you're designing graphics for games, you've got some additional considerations. Uh, it'll really help people get a uh, bigger perspective of all the issues at hand. However, aside from just adding projects our existing courses, we're going to be offering three new courses, as I mentioned before. The first, course, which is tentatively titled ESIS 290, is Introduction to Game Design and Game Implementation. This is our sophomore level course where students will learn the basics of design and programming. It essentially gives, as you can read, a mile high overview of the basic issues involved in game development. We're going to cover all those topics that you saw in the previous slide in light detail. We're not going to take the students and throw, tie weights to them and throw them into the deep lake that is game programming. So we're going to cover deep basic math, some graphics, some simple sound, uh, basic AI techniques more often than not state machines, data structures, simulation issues, and we're also going to allow the students to fool around in the lab uh, and try to create their own small projects and see what they come up with. Again, we're going to give them, excuse me, we're going to give them some of the resources that are available in the lab including some pre-built game engines, some pre-built game SDKs, so they don't have to worry about all the implementation issues of, the, of this stuff themselves. They just need to worry about learning how to use it. The next course in the series, delve into the more advanced issues of game development. We're talking about spatial data structures, shaders, and some of the more advanced graphics things you can do on recent hardware, anima animation, code optimization, fancy AI techniques, large-scale software design, because games can get very, very long. And all these topics will into, uh, be integrated into some of the more advanced projects that we're going to have students doing. Again, these are not quite on the scale of full game, but they're going to be very large projects that the students can really sink their teeth into and see how these issues at hand really come into play. Literally, this is a game we're talking about after all. And perhaps the most exciting course that we have is 396L, tentative title right now because it's a special topics course. This is going to be our advanced game project course. This is the class that Professor Buckner referred to earlier where we have everybody involved in it. We have ESA students doing the programming. We have in, uh, students from the Cleveland Institute of Art working on a corresponding course at the same time who are going to be integrated together into teams and the students will be challenged to complete an entire game all the way to box and manual in one semester. A nearly impossible task if they don't pick their scope properly, but we'll, we'll see what happens with this. This is actually going to be offered in the fall. It's going to debut alongside the lab and Professor Buckner is one of the people who's going to be teaching it. It should be interesting. We also have a couple of music majors in there who want to design, uh, do music design, do score design. Uh, we also have a couple of 